I'm Matt, along with Craig of the Thunder Guys, sitting in tonight. Uh, big fan of the show, Rich DeCray. I uh, sent all kinds of emails and, and text messages and Twitters asking how he can be a part of uh, Polar Opposites. And so here's the deal. Uh, Rich, you're the fence because uh, Craig's to your left, I'm to your right, and you're the deciding factor as we uh, get in here and we talk about things. A couple things we're going to talk about. I, I do want to talk about, because uh, I, like, I feel like we're going to argue tonight. Um, and for those of you that are listening to the podcast, which you don't realize that we just had a big argument, so I know we're going to argue, but I feel like we're going to argue about a couple of things. I, I want to talk about game one, obviously. Um, I want to talk about things that we didn't see coming in game one. We've got to talk about things that uh, Oklahoma City has to do different in game two. Um, but I, there's also some fan interaction things that I want to talk about as well. Um, and then we got to get into Billy Donovan's comment. Um, if, if you're a professional lip reader, which I don't think I am, but clearly, did you, did you see the video? I, I saw it, yeah. Do you feel like that's what he said? Yeah. Can't absolutely. play canter? Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're going to get into that as well. Let, let's start, let's start uh, with the game. Oklahoma city, 29 points in the first quarter, 25 in the second, 20 in the third, 13 in the fourth. I say a hot start. You say that's just what they do. They start fast. But this team, did they peak too early in Houston with that first quarter? Just kind of, you know, th- put all their eggs in that one basket and didn't just – because you see a slow fade to when he got to the fourth quarter. It Honestly, it looked like a playoff team and the Brooklyn Nets. Right. I think – I don't know. That, that, that's a good question. Um, but really – it. Even though they had the lead at the end of the first quarter, it, it still felt like they were a step behind Houston almost, or they should have been capitalizing more on, on their opportunities. I felt like um, they should have had a larger lead than just two points after one. Um, and I remember leaning over to um, to Zach, after, um, the other Thunder guy, after, after the first quarter, and I said, I'm not happy with that quarter. Even though we were winning, I still felt like they could have played a lot better. Um, and then, you know, the, like, yeah, second and third quarter were, were awful. It only got worse as, as the game went on. I think, I think Houston made the better in-game adjustments, but I also think that they they kind of threw out a game plan that the Thunder weren't prepared for, and so hopefully, um, you know, Billy Donovan can make the necessary adjustments heading into Game Two. Which reminds me of the coaching conversation that we have to have at some point. But let, let's wait. Well, it, it's going to come. Okay, so um, Andre Robertson, uh, if I were to tell you ahead of time, hey, Andre's going to score 18 points tonight. What are your thoughts? I would have thought the Thunder would would win this game. Who, you know, easily, um, he shot 70% for the night, four out of six from, from beyond the arc, which is, I mean, just unbelievable. But if you remember correctly, he, he did the same thing last year in the playoffs, kind of played subpar all season long, offensively, that is. Um, he was spectacular on the defensive side of the ball. Um, but he, he really did step it up offensively during the playoffs, and it got a lot of people excited about Robertson heading into, into this season. And um, he kind of just went back to being – the way he the way he has been his whole career, um, but yeah, he, he played well, and um, I think if the Thunder can fix their other issues, which we'll talk about, um, I think his contribution on offense can be can be huge for this team in the playoffs. Which is more surprising to you, Andre Robertson's eighteen or Patrick Beverly's twenty one? Uh, Patrick Beverly's twenty one. Um, well, I, I I say that, but Patrick Beverly has the tendency to get hot from beyond the arc, which is what he did. Um, he shot the ball from way out there pretty efficiently, um, as well as he, he, he outplayed Russell Westbrook. I mean, that's the only way you can, you can really put it. He, he defended Russ well, and at at one point, Russ, you could read his lips. He said, he can't guard me, but I thought he did a fantastic job job. at at guarding Russ. So, okay. So we're, we're about to jump into an epic debate and I think you just gave me some fodder for that, but okay. So you got Andre with, with, with 18, Patrick Beverly scoring 21, and then Russell at 22. Again, I'm, I'm thinking, I know your answer here, but what, what's the biggest surprise out of those three? If I, if I were to tell you, uh, again, looking at crystal ball, and I'm telling you, hey, Andre Robinson's going to drop 18, you're like, yeah, you know, but right. Patrick Beverly's going to put in 21, and you're like, oh. And then if I tell you that Russell's only going to score 22, 
you've got those three pieces of the pie. What what are your thoughts? Russ, the Thunder have played well when Russ doesn't score 30, 40 points. I, I don't think that that's – I don't think the Thunder need him to score. They need him to be the facilitator on, on offense, but – um, he's all, they, he also has to have guys to knock down the shots. And so whenever he's not hitting shots, which he was like, what, 8 of 20? No, 6 of 23 or something like that. And then his teammates aren't hitting shots. He's forced to keep taking those shots, the, the bad shots, and um, it's a recipe for disaster. Okay, so he, let's just jump into this. Okay, so this is, this is going to happen. Um, one thing that we, we haven't talked about yet, but we'll just throw it in there just so we can get in there, is, is how much Oklahoma City got dominated inside by Hilario and, uh, and Capella specifically. And we can come back to that if we have time. But your, your point is that you're going to make is um, – I'm going to set this argument up because, like I said, we just had it. Your point that you're going to make is that James Harden is surrounded by better, a better cast of characters than Russell Westbrook. That, yeah. That's your point. Yeah, I think it's clear. I don't think there's any – there shouldn't be any so, discussion on that. Uh, well, there, there, there should be because I, my point is, is that neither team has an all star other than their, their main guy. I mean, it's, it's the Rockets are at the end of the day. If, if James Harden's hurt, the Rockets are done. And at the end of the day, if Russell Westbrook's hurt, then the Thunder is done. But I think what, what really it boils down to, and I think you have to. James Harden is such a Russell Westbrook, he he's more physical. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that. He is the more physical player. And I, I don't think that there's anywhere of, on the floor that Russell doesn't think that he can't score from. Right. And we've seen that. I mean, anywhere from, well, even, even beyond half court. But I legitimately don't think there's anywhere on the floor that Harden can't score from. There's a difference in mindset. And I think Harden is the better scorer of the two guys. And when you when you look at the attention that Harden draws, you now Richard's giving me the look, the stank guy. But who but, won the scoring title this season? But, but I'm saying is, but he, but we're gonna get into this. I'm just setting it up. When you look at the attention that that James Harden draws, it, it, it's it's different. I mean, he Harden has those guys. They they are good because of Harden. And if you remove Harden, I mean, look, Mike D'Antoni is a terrible basketball coach, in my opinion. He, he's failed in Phoenix. He failed in the Lakers. Why is all of a sudden he a coach of the year candidate? And why are the, the, uh, the Rockets, after losing Dwight Howard, in the third seed of the Western Conference playoffs? It's not because of Mike D'Antoni. It's because they have an excellent team. No. As a team, one through nine. That, 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 where they get this, significant playing it's time. It's basically outside of Lou Williams and Ryan Anderson – and I, I don't think you're going to say either one of those guys are, are superstars. But outside of I wanted Lou Williams. But I, I think he would be an excellent backup I, point guard. But for outside us. of outside of Lou Williams and Ryan Anderson, this is the same team from last year without Dwight Howard. So what made but the they're diff- running a different offense? Exactly my point. They're running a different offense where they're putting up more shots. And when you put up more shots. It's it, it's like you know I know football was your sport that you excelled in and as a quarterback how many times a game did you want to pass every time and that's what Dan and Tony said guys you want to shoot the three shoot the three they 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 took ten more shots than the Thunder but that's 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 a pretty big gap when you're talking basketball and they out they beat them on the boards not by a whole lot but they beat them on the boards. To me, that was the most surprising thing about the game, is that the Thunder shot better from three than, than Houston did. Not by much, but they, they shot better. But what, are the, what is the shot discrepancy? Oklahoma City had a better percentage, but how many more shots from three did Houston take? Four. I think that's bad coaching on, on Oklahoma City's part. I mean, when, you, when, you, when you've got guys like Enos Cantor and you've got guys like Steven Adams – and you're jacking it up from the three. You're trying to play the the rocket style of basketball. But that's the, the that exactly. You're right. But they they couldn't. Houston denied that. Stephen Adams had six points. Cantor had eight. Six points. points on how many shots? Six shots. And how many shots did Cantor have? Seven. I feel like those guys have to be in double digit shooting. How many Cantor only, played, Cantor only played sixteen minutes though. Yeah, he's gonna play a lot less than that. I think. I don't Wednesday know. Night. I don't know about that. All right, we'll get into that. 
So, what, so question? well, here, here's my point. We, we've got this epic, and it's not as epic as it was uh, just a few minutes ago, but my, my point is this. I think Harden's the better scorer. I think Westbrook's the better athlete. I think Harden makes his team better than Westbrook makes his team. Now, man to man, if you compare, so these, your votes, your, your votes, James Harden for MVP then because it always podcast, has been. You just you said there was a clear winner in Russell Westbrook last podcast. No, I think when we're looking at the votes, when we're looking at at what the the stackups were on those votes, I I've always been James Richard. You have conversations with me multiple times about this. I how many how long have I been saying James Harden? Basically, I wouldn't say since day one, but since the at least since the All Star break, is Russell Westbrook and James Harden. If that's the only two candidates, yes, you have said James Harden. See, the fence has spoken, and we have to live with what the fence says. At least says. that's what he says to me. I don't know what he says to you. I mean, I, I think I, I think Russell Westbrook's going to win it. If you, if you made me bet on who's going to win it, I think Westbrook's going to win it. And the truth is, I can't say Westbrook doesn't deserve it if he wins it. But that's, that's where I'm different. I, if, if Westbrook wins it, I will say he deserves it. But if Harden wins it, I don't think there's very many Oklahoma City fans that are going to say that he deserves it. And, and, and here's the thing. The two teams I hate most in the NBA are Golden State and the Houston Rockets. So I'm, there's no bias here for me. I am not a Houston Rockets fan because they bounced my Clippers from the playoffs. But whatever. I just – I think Harden – if, if I'm starting a franchise and I get Westbrook Harden, I'm taking Harden. You're crazy. Uh, that's fine. I can be crazy. Listen, I'm a big stat guy. Right. So I want you to show me. You can do it next podcast, whenever it may be. I want you to show me a stat that says the Thunder – or that sh- says that Westbrook has the better team around him. Show me a stat. What you're saying is that Harden does not have a better team. That it's, I'm it's saying the they're about the same, yeah. It's not like Westbrook's creating less shot opportunities. He's getting guys open looks. They're not making them. But and he, that's there's nothing he can do about it. I, but I feel like you're making that you're making that statement from a from a game one perspective. I'm, not, I'm talking about the season. When you look at how many guys they have in double digits, James Harden has eight options to pass the ball to. What does Westbrook have? Maybe Depot. Well, on one he night? doesn't play with. Maybe he doesn't play with night? eight other guys. But the the point is, the, the, here's here's what here's what you're not considering. You're not considering margin of victory. You're not considering garbage time. The th- the Thunder had less garbage time games than Houston did. And when you look at margin of victory, I don't know the stats, but I, I'm willing to bet Houston has a larger margin of victory. Than what Oklahoma City has. Okay, well, so okay, even even if we take off those last three, let's say the starting five, they're still all in double digits. He still has four. James Harden has four guys around him that can score the ball at any given time. When you look at Russell Westbrook, yeah, Andre Robertson had 18 points the other night, but that's not consistent. Stephen Adams has his nights, but I mean, he has no consistent scoring around him. When you look at James Harden's team. He's got five guys who are, on average, getting at least ten points per game, and that I mean that's that's the difference there. But but Russell Westbrook has guys inside, and every I mean everybody except for I mean I, I don't know Richard you're more of a Clint Capella guy than I am but um, I don't I, I, look Ryan Anderson he can shoot from inside outside. I don't think. Houston has a big body guy inside, and that's that's the that's a difference for Russ than than for James Harden because everyone everyone in, in this offense for Houston, it's offense designed to shoot from outside to shoot from the perimeter, and they knock down the shots. That but the, but the point is I'm saying it's two different brands of basketball. It, it, you can't you can't put this if you put this Houston Rockets team into the style of play that Oklahoma City uses, it's not the same team. They're not as good. It's a I di- think they play the exact same style. No. And we talked about this again last podcast. We agree that they were the same style of basketball. We, they both, they're both going to run. They're both going to push the tempo. But Oklahoma City is not a perimeter across the board. They're not a perimeter. Who are the perimeter shooters for Oklahoma City? you got Victor Oladipo. 
You've got Russell Westbrook, who's not as good as he needs to be for the shots that he takes. He shot you've a got, better percentage this season than James Harden from beyond the arc. You've got Doug McDermott now. Who didn't even play three <laughs> minutes. But or the, two minutes, I'm but that's sorry. But that's the point I'm making. is You, you don't have the, that across-the-board perimeter shooting for Oklahoma City that you do uh, for Houston. Again, proving that no, Houston I'm, is the better team. It, no, it's proven it's two different styles. Let's go to football, okay? Let's say you have one you have one offense that's uh, – let's take Deshaun Watson and Clemson, right? They are a, a spread the field, and they are a just move the ball, throw it 60 times a game. And then you've got Ohio State. They're line up and smash mouth football. You can't say just because one team plays this style, one team plays that style – well, sure, uh, uh, Clemson's going to have more receiving yards and they're going to have more passing yards. doesn't make them a better football team than Ohio State. It makes them a better offense, which is no, what we're talking Ohio about No, Ohio State's going to be ground and pound, man. It's two different styles. It doesn't matter when you're comparing. Okay, so Houston style's better. With which, their personnel, yes, I agree. But I, I, I don't think again. I don't think Mike D'Antoni's a great coach. He, he, you guy, he failed at Houston. I uh, failed at Phoenix. Failed at the Lakers. He's not. He's. I mean, find me something Mike, Mike D'Antoni's done. He didn't just become a, a genius head coach. He got James Harden, and and that. And if you want an argument for the MVP, how about James Harden takes a failed coach and turns him into a Coach of the Year candidate? Where Russell Westbrook. I mean, I, I I'm not convinced that Ru- that Billy Donovan was the right hire. I'm not convinced that Oklahoma City's better off with Billy Donovan than they were with Scotty Brooks. I'm laughing right now because I'm supposed to be the Thunder Homer here, and I'm trying to convince you that Houston's the better team, and you're trying to convince me that Oklahoma City, not necessarily is the better team, but is is the same quality. I think I think it comes I think it comes down to the better player between the two, the better player. Russell Westbrook is a more physical and more emotional player than James Harden. He's more efficient in every category there is. Except for wins and losses. You know why? Because (laughs) James Harden has the better team around him. Rich, jump in here, man. We need the fence to speak again. What do you got to say about this? (laughs) About who the better better team is? Yeah. I mean, I think... I'm just going to state some facts here. Craig, you like numbers, so here they come, okay? Okay. Houston, the better shooting team. Oklahoma City, City, the better rebounding team. When a poor shooting team, or when a shooting team begins shooting poorly, there are plenty of rebounds to go around. So can we cross those off the board and say that those are equal? Okay, and so we'll cross Russell Westbrook, and and we're certainly going to cross James Harden off if we're crossing Russell Westbrook off that, right? Okay, so we're just going to mix those things, and we're going to say the teams are equal. <laughs> okay, I let's, just, well, here's here's the thing. Let, let's do this. Let, let's table this for just a little bit because of two reasons. Reason number one, this series is not over. I don't expect this to be a sweep, and I don't think you do either. No. This series isn't over. And number two, this isn't the last recording. So we can revisit this because I really feel like there's going to be a game, and it may be Wednesday night. It may be game three, game four. There's mm-hmm. going to be a game when Oklahoma City is going to give fits to this Houston team because Houston's going to have a poor shooting night. At that point, I'd like to come back and revisit this conversation but yeah but here's what scares me about that is i think that poor shooting night was sunday for for (laughs) houston okay um well we'll see we'll we'll see what happens okay let let me let me jump back in here for just a second um andre robinson 18 points unexpected patrick beverly 21 points unexpected i really feel like russell westbrook james harden are going to equal out james harden had the better of the two he had the better night uh on sunday night but, I, I mean, at any moment, I mean, are you confident that they, he's going to have a better night on Wednesday night than Russell Westbrook? I'm not, and I don't think anybody is. I think with these two guys, you never know. I, I'm looking for that game, and that's going to happen at some point. I feel like it would be game three or game four where both of those guys are having epic nights. How cool would it be to have a game where both of those guys are 40-plus points for their teams? I feel like we're going to get to see that before this series is over. So I'm, I'm saying those two guys are a wash. Here's where – this game was lost 
And where I, if I'm an Oklahoma City fan, I've got the biggest concern. It's inside. Yeah. Because, and this, I feel like poor coaching had something to do with it. I, I don't know what's going on with Anis Cantor. I don't know what's going on with Steven Adams. But I feel like when those guys, if you want to go in there and bang around with those guys, they stand up to the challenge and they become more physical and they love that. But if you go in there and you jump around those guys, then they just kind of fade out because they're physical, but I don't think they're athletic. And that scares me if I'm an Oklahoma City fan. I'm not sure that that they either one of them, Cantor or Adams, fits into this, this matchup against Houston. But they're, that's bad. If, I mean, I if that's the case, that's it's, really bad. It's bad. They're, they're, not, they're not comfortable with – and they, they're talking about it on the broadcast during the game is that Billy Donovan never went with his Cantor and Adams on the floor at the same time. It's because Houston has four guys who can drive to the basket – basket at any given time and so when you've got both of you know the big men out there who can't guard anybody if it's two feet away from the rim then you've got issues and so well we've all seen we've all seen the the video we saw it in the game and then we've seen the tweets of Cantor trying to guard James Harden bad situation he got caught on a switch up and Harden Harden had fun with that. Yeah, it was the same with Steven Adams. He did it all game. Right, but, but but the point I'm making is we've also seen the video where Patrick Beverly and Clint Capella got around Cantor and got the alley-oop. And Cantor literally had no idea what to do. And that's when Donovan leans over and says, can't play Cantor. Right, but this is not an issue that is hap- just now happening for the first time. Cantor, it's, it's why he's not the starting center for the Thunder. He can't play defense. Right, but I'm, what I'm saying is it's even more exposed against these type of players. And I'm I'm not as shocked about Cantor as much as I am about Adams because Adams should just be able to body Clint Capella. There's not a, there's not a big man that that Houston has that Adams shouldn't be able to body. I, I think it was the defensive scheme that the Thunder put together. You can't switch – so then you agree with me it's bad coaching? Agreed, yes. Okay. You can't switch the five onto the one. At no point should should Russell Westbrook be guarding the, a center. and no mm-hmm. point should, you know, Adams be guarding uh, uh, James Harden. So I think one through four, you, you can make that switch. But when it gets to that, that five, I think you have to just fight around that screen, which when you do that, you're giving up the three-point shot. So it's – like I said, it's it's kind of you pick your poison exactly, but the Thunder only allowed or Houston, I should say, only made ten shots from beyond the arc. I think the Thunder can live with that if they're only going to make ten. Yeah, but but I, I and you said it earlier. I don't think Oklahoma City was prepared for for what Houston did inside, and and you know what I'm saying I I don't think um, that you and I weren't the only ones surprised by that. Billy Donovan was surprised by that. Yeah, I think the Thunder. They game plan so hard to, to defend the perimeter that they, they left the middle wide open. And by the time they tried to correct that, it, it was far too late. Um, like, yeah, I mean, you, like I said, you had your big men out there trying to guard the perimeter, and then you've got backdoor alley-oops or wide-open dunks. Mm-hmm. Or um, when they did make that switch, you had James Harden flying past everybody right to the rim. And so – it's just got to be a completely different defensive scheme, I think, in game two. So what do you do? I mean, I mean, you, you, you've got you've got Donovan lean over to Mo Cheeks, can't play Cantor in that situation. Can't play Cantor. Yeah, can't I, play Cantor in this series. I think that was in, in that in that game given that that he couldn't he couldn't play because that, but that's fourth quarter when he says that. Right. I think. I think you have to try to play Cantor in game two. And and you can't switch. Like I said, I keep going back to this. I know, but you can't. You can't switch a center on, onto the onto the point guard. You have to figure out a way to fight through that screen, get around it, whatever it may be. And I think you have to kind of just leave Cantor posted up inside the paint, and and you know just try your best to keep that there because you're, you're going to need him on offense. Mm-hmm. And then if it, if it's not happening, if it can't do it, then I think you have to I think you have to look at giving. Sabonis some more minutes. Um, I know he's not a five, but play him as kind of an extension at the four. Um, or maybe even, you know, Nick Collison has plenty of experience. He, he's not going to be able to play, give you very many minutes, but he could for sure, you know, if you can fix some some problems with Steven Adams, he can give you some s- solid minutes while Adams is, is getting a break on the bench. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think 
they'll try to play Cantor in game two, um, just with a different scheme, and, and then if it if it doesn't work, then yeah, I, I think he has to be a no go for the series. How much time do you give Cantor? And in, in, in this in this situation, uh, how much time do you do you give him? You know, he had sixteen minutes 16, in game one. Yeah. Do you give him sixteen minutes again? I think so. I think. Or you do you give him, give him one a... rotation and say, "Hey, nothing's changed"? I guess it depends on how bad the situation is. If it's if it's getting out of hand, then I think you have to just make the call. Um, I mean, I, and here's where I'm going with this. And again, I'm the hater. Okay, that, that's that's our role here. Mm. But you know how I feel, and we've talked about. We've never had the big conversation about coaching. But if you're Scotty Brooks, you, I'm mean, not Scotty Brooks. If, if you're Billy Donovan, you just got out coached in Game One. You're you're on camera saying can't play Cantor, and you give Cantor another 16 minutes, and it's just as bad as it was Sunday night. Are you not indicting yourself as a bad coach? Yeah, but I don't, I don't think I don't think Billy Donovan's a bad coach. Um, okay, I'm putting you on the spot. Is he as good as Scott Brooks? I'm gonna force this conversation. I, I don't think he has the right team around him, to be honest. Listen. Okay, okay and that's okay, Sam okay, Presti's okay, fault. Not, not. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm conceding. That's here's my Richard. Point. Hold real, on, Richard. Defense hold on. really wants to say hold something on. here. But here's hold up. What I'm saying is, before you jump in there, you're saying that's not Billy Donovan's fault. That's Sam Presti's fault. I think it was a given that this year was a rebuilding year as it is. Good. Do you do you feel like like no? I mean, you're. And again, I'm just. Trying to put words in your mouth to get a better understanding. You feel like no one saw Kevin Durant leaving. The same press, he didn't see him leaving. Russell Westbrook. They like saw that, him. I mean, that they was a bombshell, they, and there was nothing left they could do after he left. Yeah. I okay. mean, at that point in the summer, you can't. July 4th. Yeah. Is when that happened. Okay, you can't. Independence Day has forever been ruined for Oklahoma City fans. If you. <laughs> There's no way that, that Sam Presti could get this team back to being a championship quality team in one season. It's not happening. But they – okay. But, all right. So all right. I'm, I'm, before, I'll be quiet. Go ahead. Before Richard says something or before you try to jump into the next thing, we're talking about Billy Donovan not being a good coach. Look what people were saying last year when he outcoached Greg Popovich. I, I, he lost by 32 points in right. game one. I agree. And came back and completely outcoached him. I'm with you, but I also feel like – they won thing. the most games out of any NBA I coach in their like, first season ever. I, I feel like the same thing that we said, uh, that I said about Mike D'Antoni can apply here. Players can make the coach. And and I feel like Mike D'Antoni is who he is with Houston, not because of what he did or what he's doing, but because of James Harden. And I feel like the same thing when you have Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook, I think you and I could have coached them to 40 plus wins last year just by saying, what do you guys want to do? You know what I'm saying? And so I feel like this has been a, this year has been a stronger test and I'll concede personnel wise. He, he doesn't, he doesn't have much for what he wants to do. But, and again, another topic for another time. I don't know that they're going to get any better next year personnel wise. And we'll, we'll cover that after the season yeah, we'll, ends. we'll get there. But I'm, I'm not saying he's a bad coach. What I am saying, I don't know that he's as good of a coach as Scott Brooks. And there is where I think Oklahoma City may have made their biggest mistake. Richard, you're dying to jump in here. <laughs> well, I was going By the way, to, welcome to the podcast. I was going – this is the second time I've said something. I know. I'm just I saying was, you're actually going to contribute something now, really of substance. I was going to ask a question. Um <laughs> But at the same time, Matt, I'm going to disagree with you. On the well, Scott, you're fired. On the Scott Brooks, because his body of work was with Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, James Harden. Serge Ibaka. Serge Ibaka. Should we go down the list? No, I'm just saying. If the, if the players make the coach in some instances, that's who his players were. So for me, now he inherits a team with John Wall, Bradley Beal, Otto Porter. It, it's... It's a okay. difficult jump for me. No, That's I, no I, was, I was hoping you were going to go there because what did Washington do last year compared to this year? They made the playoffs. Oh, look where they're at again. I'm just saying, I, I feel like I feel like they're a better team from last year, and I feel like they're going to go further in the playoffs, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, again, time was out. This isn't the last podcast. So, um, yeah, Craig's pointing out time. Okay, I, are you done? Uh, I, I don't want to interrupt my, you. My only question was um, Oklahoma City's toyed around with the idea 
playing Andre Robertson as a power forward, even though it's not his natural position. It's what he played in college. Is I mean, is that something they could do to throw kind of an oddball look at Houston and really throw off a guy and say, hey, we're going to pull Clint Capella away from the basket, maybe open some things up for Russell Westbrook, maybe open up some shots from a lagging behind closeout defender for for Robertson. Right. Is, is that something that's well, feasible? Let me ask you then, if they did that, who would they play at the small forward? I, I don't know. That's why because I'm asking. Because I'm just thinking then you're opening up more defensive liabilities with having to put Sabonis on the floor as a small forward or – Alex Sabrina's if you moved him, I mean, he's going to be playing the two regardless, but I still don't think there's enough defense if, if you were to do that. I mean, and again, well, that's what's great. I, I don't feel like this series is over. I don't feel like it's going to be a sweep, and we'll be able to jump back in and talk more strategy because, well, I mean, I think we're all agreed. We've got to see a different strategy Wednesday night than what we saw Sunday, correct? Yes, it's got to be. Okay, let me let me run into a couple quick hit things uh, that are going to make you mad. Um MVP, a lot of talk about the MVP, and it's going to continue throughout this series. Uh, Houston fans are proving their case after Sunday night. Uh, this proves Harden should have been the MVP or should be the MVP over Westbrook. Oklahoma City fans um, say, no, you can't judge it off of one game. You, that's, that, that's just bull. That you don't, you, that's, it doesn't matter. My question is this. If, let's say um, – Let's say Russell scores 50 points or 40 points, or what did Harden have? Harden had 37 points, and he leads Oklahoma City to victory uh, Wednesday night. Are, have Oklahoma City fans voided that argument altogether? Because, I mean, you're, you're going to have to have the argument until the official votes are released. But have Oklahoma City fans voided that argument by saying it doesn't matter what that one game was? Because they can't – I don't feel like they can come back now and say – well, see, now Russell Westbrook should have been the MVP. Look what he did in game two. So you're saying if Westbrook bounces back and has a better game two, it voids that? Yeah, I'm saying because because Houston fans were saying Harden proved he should have been the MVP by his game one performance. If Russell outperforms him in game two, I don't feel like Oklahoma City fans can come back and say, no, now that proves Russell should be the MVP because of the way they reacted to, to game one by saying it doesn't matter. It's a season, not a game or a series. Right. So Thunder now fans you shouldn't be able to say that. Yeah, yeah so Thunder but, fans have voided that, that part of their argument. So we shouldn't see anything on Twitter Wednesday night if, if Oklahoma City wins. We shouldn't say anything on Twitter touting Russell as the MVP based off of that performance. And it's a good thing these Twitter fans, and I'm doing this quote-unquote with my Air fingers quotes. here because, because – Twitter fans are some of the worst fans in the entire world. Um, it's a good thing they don't decide the MVP or have a vote. But and I saw I did it's funny because I did see a tweet and I wish I remembered who tweeted it. But they said if this Thunder team didn't have Russell Westbrook, they might finish seventh in the Big Twelve in, in basketball. So I just think I mean I know this goes back to our argument at the very beginning. I, I think when you're talking about an MVP in any case, it it's James Harden has help from his teammates. Okay, so we'll, we'll, I'm sure that's going to come up again in future podcasts. Um, t- two, two things real fast. And the, my, other, my other dig at Oklahoma City fans, the Stephen Adams screen on, uh, on Patrick Beverly uh, was vicious. Um, I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. I like physical play. I do feel like it was a moving screen, but whatever. Um, is that a moral victory for Oklahoma City fans? No, and I knew you would bring this up. At the time, I, I sent it to you, and I was really excited, but what you got to realize is the Thunder were down by nearly 15 points. That happened. The Thunder got within seven points. Right. It was a big – the Thunder were in the game at that point. It wasn't like, oh, we're look, we're down by 20 points, but look what happened. Uh-huh. That's what it turned into. But I think at the time, that was something that was – it should have been a pivotal point in the game, but credit to Houston, they, they turned it around and, and they – you know, expanded the lead right. further. I'm just, uh, yeah. I, I, I I'm just, not responsible for, <laughs> for the way You that represent the fan base. I do not. I just feel like it's, it's much like the, the, the cupcakes with Kevin Durant. That stuff goes a lot further if you win the game, you know? Um, and I just, uh, a, a great, a great play. I mean, again, I, I, 
there's moving screens all over in the NBA. So I don't care that it was a moving screen. I, I love I love physical play. I, I enjoyed it. But the two things I kept thinking were, number one, uh, moral victory because they got drilled in that game. And number two, if, if, a, if a player from Houston were to set a screen like that on an Oklahoma City player, it would have been a dirty play. I'm confident it would have been labeled a dirty play. But it, they're they're Houston fans that are saying it's a dirty play. You That's what say I'm that saying. Any, but it's it going to flip. It's it going to flip sides. Okay. Base. All right. So let's uh, – Let's let's jump in here. I've, I've had can I give you a fist bump? I've had fun arguing. I mean, uh, that's what we're supposed to do. Is we're supposed to argue, and hopefully, I'll get all the hate mail, and you won't. Um, I want to I want to run through the playoff series real fast, and and if anything has changed in what we initially thought, because there's one series that uh, I feel has has changed significantly, and by the time this podcast goes live, will have probably changed even significantly more. Um, let's start in the East. Milwaukee, Toronto. I called Milwaukee uh, with the upset in that series. Um, game two is in play right now. I have no idea what's going on in that game. I don't but either. You, you called Toronto. I called Milwaukee with the upset. How do you feel about that as just, just based off of game one? Um, I don't think anything changes. I still have the Raptors winning in six. Hey, Fence, Rich, Rich, give us a scroll on that game while, uh, while you're sitting here um, uh, refereeing this. All right, so you got you got the, the I Raptors, still, I still in, have Raptors six. in six. Okay, I, I, I'm I sticking with my guns, man. I felt pretty good after uh, after Milwaukee took game one. That's all you got to do is you got to take one in Toronto. Um, what, what is it? It's one-to-one one on the yeah, series? They, so what was the – game two. It's 106 one Okay, so but but Milwaukee did what they needed to do. They've got home court now. They took game one. Um, Sorry, one hundred, not one hundred one. Okay, um, Cleveland, Indiana, as so close, but yet so far away. For I didn't Indiana, watch right? the game, but I'm. I guess Paul George choked it off at the end. Is that what happened? Paul George is not in a good spot right now, emotionally, spiritually, physically. He's mad at everyone. He's throwing his teammates under the bus. Listen. Yeah, I Paul, know. Listen, I know. Paul George gets to play basketball. Good basketball for two months out of the year, and he gets to be considered a top ten player. I'm just has, saying, I mean, um, there, there's more. Um, I, I think Indiana's done. That, that, that that's going to be a. Uh, that was our buzzer telling us we're out of time. Um, that's going to be a uh, a sweep, in my opinion, just because there's too much locker room mess there. Um, I did have Cleveland in five, so I think you're going to be spot on. Maybe well, you may get that in four. Yeah. Um, Hawks Wizards. Um, Scotty Brooks, baby. I mean, I, I I did I picked the Wizards to win. Okay. So, um, well, yeah. This this is where it's changed for me. I I I'm pretty confident. I didn't go back and listen, but I'm pretty confident that I said Boston would would sweep Chicago. There's a good chance Chicago is going to take that series back to the Windy City, up two games to none. Yeah, and I, and I, I had Boston in five. So if, yeah, and I don't I don't think you can. I, I I was completely wrong here. I mean, this is the one where I'm like. Way off because my upset was Milwaukee, Toronto. This is one versus eight, mm-hmm. and and I, you can't. I don't. I mean, it's a tragedy what happened with Isaiah so okay, Thomas. How much, how much, I don't think it because Isaiah Thomas was the leading scorer. I get that, but how much does that affect not only Isaiah Thomas but those around him? I don't think as much as to make that big of a difference. I mean, you're the number one seed against the number eight seed. Yeah, there might be a little bit of a funk, but come on. This, that, I mean, again, I'm going to go back to what I said in our last podcast. Things were so bad in Chicago. Fred Hoiberg's job was on the line. They were they did the fire sale. That's how Oklahoma City got Tosh Gibson and Doug McDermott. Um, this, this is an upset of epic proportions. I'm going to think back to way before you were born. Uh, Rich, you were probably in diapers, but – I don't know. People listening to the podcast may remember Dikembe Mutombo and the Denver Nuggets upsetting the top seeded um, Seattle SuperSonics eight versus one way back in the day. This is going to be every bit as epic as that if it goes down that way. I, yeah, and I I'm shocked. I'm shocked by it. All right, jump jump over to the West. Uh, we'll start with my Clippers. Uh, uh, just I, I sent you a text. I think it was yesterday. I'm officially on the fire Doc Rivers bandwagon. Um, now that would change. I, I never expected LA to make it out of the second round. I don't think anyone's going to beat Golden State this year. But you, you got if, if if you're the Clippers, you got to beat Utah, especially without Gobert. You got to beat Utah, right? Right. And but the now thing you don't about have to sweep. But you right. Got, but the thing about it is that this this has to be the year for the Clippers. It has to happen this year because this team's going to be completely different next season. 
I think they're at least going to have a different coach. I next think they're going to have a whole different team next season. But they're they're not a championship team. They've never they've, I, they've but, but that's my point is that the time has that your gap to win a championship with with your current team I, has I, expired. I, but see, I don't think they're going to be as different as you think. I think the one guy that they could be different is Chris Paul. I think that's. See, I feel like he's the most set in stone there. No, I don't think he is. I, I, I think. So you're going to build around. You're going to build around John and, and Blake Griffin. Blake's going to resign, and they're going to build around Blake and DJ, and they're going to go after somebody in free agency because I think they're going to lose Chris Paul. Because I mean, I think Chris Paul wants to win a championship. I think he's going to go somewhere, somewhere else, uh, where he's not going to have as big of a role as he has with the Clippers to have a chance to win. But you don't think. Blake Griffin's going to want to do, be doing the same thing? I think Blake wants to stay in L.A. I mean, I, Blake loves L.A., and he's on record saying he loves L.A. I, yeah, and I know I what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. Um, but I, I think I think Blake's going to stay. I, the, the, I'm, I'm less confident that Doc Rivers will be there, and I'm less confident that Chris Paul will be there than I am that that Blake Griffin's going to be there. I mean, who who is leading that charge to keep DeAndre Jordan? That was Blake Griffin. Right. And so, I mean, you think he's going to do all that to keep DeAndre and then he's going to bolt himself? I, I don't think so. I, I mean, we'll see. You we'll see. don't know what these guys are. Yeah, it's going to be a fun summer. Uh, old but, news, but. But it is, it's, it's going to be a fun summer. But I think I, I think I think you're right that the team will look different next year. They, they're they not a championship team. And, and But they they got to be better than the Jazz. you got to win that series. If they if they lose this series, you got to fire Doc. I agree. And, uh, so, anyway. All right. All um, right. Golden State, Portland. I was impressed with Portland, how they how they came out of the House of Fire. I, I still don't think that changes anything with my prediction there. I agree with you. San Antonio, Memphis. I I think the, the Grizzlies win game three or game four. Did I say San Antonio in five or six? I think you said five. Okay, I'm, I was hoping I, I said five. Yeah, and I think it's looking like I think you're. But but remember what I said. I that that San Antonio is going to beat up. I mean, Memphis is going to beat up San Antonio. But have they? I don't know. That's <laughs> that's why I am on that. Think, um, that's what I was about to say. Is I feel like I'm less. Um, I feel like I'm less inclined, and I've already. I'm on record, so I gotta go. I gotta go with it. But I said whoever wins this Houston Oklahoma City series would beat San Antonio right. in round two. I'm less inclined of that now. Two games into this series, but I still feel like this game's this series is gonna go at least five, um, and and so um, that that leads is Oklahoma City Houston. I picked Houston. You picked Oklahoma City. I think I said six. I don't remember. You had Houston in six. I had the Thunder in six. Yeah, so both so, are still. So I, still I, I feel. Yeah. I feel pretty much on track there. Okay, so Oklahoma City, Houston, game two, Wednesday night. Um, Heartland-Sports.com. Heartland-Sports.com. We'd love to see you guys come to the website. Feel free to jump in on our conversations. Uh, thanks, uh, Craig. Uh, Thunder guys at, at the Thunder guys yes. on Twitter. Um, Rich, uh, thanks for jumping in and, and for the most part taking my side on things. But um, uh, shame on you for that one time yeah, you disagreed with me. <laughs> Guys, have a great week. Take, take care. We'll see you later. When I wake up, yeah, I know I'm going to be. I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. And when I go out. Well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who goes along with you. And if I get drunk, well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna.